Oh, we are praying for you now and always, uh, and we always will. We've also had the chance to spend time with a lot of our first responders who we mentioned before, uh, the work that they have done since early in the morning and they have not stopped since uh, is, truly, is truly remarkable. Uh, these are individuals who in the middle of the night jumped into some very challenging environments, some very challenging territories and have not stopped in their quest to making sure that each and every person is seen and supported and lifted up. And so to our first responders, today and always, we just want to say from the bottom of our hearts, thank you. We've also had the chance to speak with both the president and the vice president, who have been full-throated in their support of everything that we're doing here in Maryland. And we just want to say how grateful we are to them, how grateful we are to the Secretary of Transportation and the Department of Transportation, who within hours of this happening, I was on the phone with the Secretary of Transportation. I think Secretary Buttigieg then called me at 3.30 in the morning. Uh, and now he and his entire team have been down here this afternoon spending time looking at the efforts, looking at the damage, and also identifying what they can do to support and help. Can't tell you enough how much we appreciate that, Mr. Secretary. And also, please, uh, please let the President and the Vice President know from the bottom of our heart how much we appreciate it as well. We've also had a chance to be here with our remarkable congressional delegation. Uh, from, from the earliest parts of the morning, our congressional delegation has been there throughout. And I always say I'm grateful that I've got such a remarkable congressional delegation. And today, I just have another example as to why I am, I am a very lucky governor to have the congressional delegation that I have. And also our state, our local elected officials, uh, Mayor, Mayor Scott, who uh, literally got a call from the very first thing in the morning. Uh, I know you have had no rest in a very long time, sir. And so I want to say how much we appreciate you. Uh, but also, it's to the members of the philanthropic community who have been reaching out and offering support. It's the members of the private sector who have been reaching out and offering support. It's the sandwich companies who have said we're going to shut down because we just want to make sure that the first responders are getting meals. Everybody has stepped up. Everybody has raised their hands to serve. And I can tell you, it is so deeply appreciated it's so deeply felt. And for everyone who is offering prayers and supports, I can tell you those prayers are working and we are grateful. And the thing that I would ask for people to remember is this. The first, this is very much still a search and rescue mission. We are still actively looking for survivors. We know, and that's the pledge we've made to these families, and this is still very much an active search and rescue mission. And there is not a single resource that we will hold off on deploying. I have already authorized the deployment of everything from air, land, and sea resources to make sure that this search and rescue operation is carried out to its fullest intent. The second thing I want to remind people is that this will not be short. There's going to be a long road. There's going to be a long road, not just as we go from search and rescue. There'll be a long road as we talk about what does the future of this region, the future of the area look like. And we're going to need each and, each and every one of you. We're thankful to have partners like what we have in the Biden-Harris administration. We're thankful for the partners that we have in our federal delegation. We're thankful for the partners we have in our state and local leadership. We're thankful for the partners that we have in the private sector and the philanthropic community. We're thankful for the partners that we have within the Moore Miller administration. We're thankful for each and every one of you, both Marylanders and non-Marylanders who have reached out and offered support. We feel it, we need it, and we are truly grateful for it. And I think just in this time, this state has been able to show what it means to be Maryland tough and Baltimore strong. And this state and this city will continue to show exactly that. And so with that, I want to turn it over to our Secretary of Transportation, Pete Buttigieg, with a deep sense of thanks and appreciation. Oh, I apologize. Before I turn it over to Secretary Buttigieg, I want to turn it over to, uh, to the dean of our, of our, of our delegation uh, and someone who has been leading from the front this entire time, and we are deeply grateful for the leadership of Senator Ben Cardin. Governor Moore, first of all, thank you very much for getting our whole team together uh, to meet this challenge and our 
prayers are with the families of those that are lost at sea at this moment. As the governor said, it's still a search and rescue. So we are hopeful uh, and we are with the families. I also want to underscore our thanks to our first responders. They did an extraordinary job acting very quickly and save lives. So we thank our first responders for everything that they have done. I, I just really want to underscore a couple points. Our first priority is the search and rescue for those that were uh, on the bridge. We then need to make sure that the, the, that the channel is reopened. It's critically important to our economy. Uh, it affects many, many jobs. It affects not only jobs here in Maryland, but around the, the country and, they, and world. So our, our next priority is to make sure we get that channel opened. And then we also need to fix and replace the bridge for the surface transportation. We're going to work together as a team. I am very impressed by all the partners that are with us today. We heard from them at the state level, at the local level, at the federal level. I particularly want to acknowledge our federal partners. The Secretary of Transportation is with us. We have the Coast Guard. We have the Army Corps of Engineers. We have the investigators. We have the Small Business Administration. They're all here because of the commitment of the partners to work together. A special thanks to President Biden, who's made it very, very clear that he'll do everything in his power to make sure that we get the help we need to deal with this challenge. But as Secretary Buttigieg told us in our briefings, he's going to need the help of Congress in order to get things done. So I want to acknowledge our team, Senator Van Hollen, my partner in the United States Senate on the Appropriations Committee and the work that he's doing. Congressman Infume is here. Congressman Trone is here. Team Maryland, our federal delegation is committed to working together. Senator Van Hollen and I got calls from our leadership that said they're prepared, Secretary Buttigieg, to do everything that we need to do in Congress to make sure you had the resources and the federal partners had the resources in order to get the job done. So I want to thank Senator Schumer for his call and his comments. Uh, Senator Murray, uh, Senator Carper, Chair of the Environment and Public Works Committee have all been in touch with us. It is a team effort and we're going to make sure that we do everything we can to protect our economy and protect the people of our state. And with that, let me just turn it back to the governor or Secretary Buttigieg. This guy woke all of us up early this morning, so thank you very much. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, and uh, I want to thank Senator Cardin and the entire delegation for their leadership. Uh, they have been on this from the first moments. Uh, and as the senator mentioned, and I'll say more about this in a moment, we'll be needing to work together uh, to make sure that uh, we uh, render all of the support that is needed at the federal level. I want to recognize the leadership of Governor Moore, who was already wide awake and hard at work when I reached him in the middle of the night. Uh, we just had a very informative briefing with his extraordinary leadership team. And I was moved to see the partnership uh, between uh, state as well as county and uh, city personnel uh, led by the county executive and the mayor working hand in glove uh, with us and with our sister federal agencies. And if there's one thing I have to say today, it is a note of gratitude for the extraordinary and courageous work of the first responders, uh, some of whom are in that cold water right now, some of whom are from right here, some of whom have traveled in to render mutual aid, all of whom are responding with extraordinary professionalism and whose work has already saved lives. And to those uh, state, county, and local responders, I would add uh, the extraordinary work of the United States Coast Guard. We should also recognize that this is an excruciating day for several families who went to bed last night uh, having it be a normal night and woke up today to news that no one wants to receive. They are hoping and praying, and we are hoping and praying with them. We are all putting our arms around the community of Baltimore, and uh, that, uh, that is true for all of this country. I've even heard from counterparts uh, as far away as the United Kingdom uh, reaching out to express their support to the people of Baltimore. As has been mentioned, I've uh, been in close contact uh, with uh, the governor, the mayor, county leadership, and the congressional delegation. Uh, and as President Biden has made clear, the federal government will provide all of the support that they need for as long as it takes. This is no ordinary bridge. This is one of the cathedrals of American infrastructure. It has been part of the skyline of this region for longer than many of us have been alive. So the path to normalcy will not be easy. It will not be quick. 
it will not be inexpensive, but we will rebuild together. In order to make sure that happens, the president's plan is to work with everyone here uh, in order to rebuild this bridge and reopen this port, including our readiness as a department to approve emergency funding as soon as we receive that request. Meanwhile, our Maritime Administration will help with port, harbor, and supply chain operations. Uh, our Federal Highway Administration will assist when it comes to the bridge itself and any ways that we can help ease roadway congestion for residents and commuters who can no longer uh, use this major thoroughfare. Uh, the Federal Aviation Administration is even involved, uh, working to keep the airspace uh, above the bridge clear for emergency personnel. PHMSA, our Pipeline and Hazardous Material Safety Administration, is on the scene to help with any hazmat issues. And our newly stood up freight office is already at work preparing for supply chain impacts that we know are coming because of the importance of this port, not just to the Baltimore region, uh, but really to the entire United States uh, economy. We're going to be working closely with the National Transportation Safety Board as they lead their independent investigation uh, and with the Coast Guard as they continue operations in the water. I've also spoken with Secretary Mayorkas, who's working to ensure that all DHS assets are integrated. So in many ways, our work is just beginning to rebuild this bridge and deal with impacts in the meantime, to reopen this port and deal with supply chain impacts in the meantime. But today we are most acutely focused on the emergency operations underway uh, and on the families that have been impacted. I have no doubt that we will rebuild together and that Baltimore will come back stronger than ever before. And with that, I will turn it back over to the governor to lead the uh, media questions. Governor? Governor, any news on uh, uh, the missing There's, uh, there, there's, there's no new information uh, about the, the, the search efforts um, that we know that we still have, uh, we still have the six individuals who are missing. Governor, when, when you talk about the investigative standpoint, how concerned are you if there were any safety violations on this ship or, or the track record of the owner operator? And Mr. Secretary, if you could speak to that as well, do you have any concerns about that? Mayor Scott, we also didn't hear from you. What are your thoughts on this tragedy today? Um, well, I'll, t I'll take it first, and I can pass it off to, to Mr. Mayor. Uh, I, I know there's a, there's a thorough investigation that's going to be going on about everything that took place last night, the things that led up to it, and also the aftermath. Uh, and so I, I don't have any further comments about uh, any, any concerns that we have about the companies that are involved, because there's still a thorough investigation that's going to take place. Thank you, Mr. Governor. Uh, I think we all know uh, this is an unspeakable tragedy. And while, as the governor just said, uh, the investigation is still underway, all of that can wait. Right now, this is about the lives of those individuals that we are searching for and nothing else. Everything else, uh, this team of folks will work together to make sure that we rebuild and do everything we need to do for our port. But right now, we need everyone to understand this is about the lives and those families who are deeply impacted. Governor. Mr. Secretary, um, this is, uh, we've seen now uh, several bridge collapses happen over the past couple of years. Obviously, this was a catastrophic, a catastrophic event, but that bridge fell very quickly. How concerned should Americans be about the bridges that they're traversing every single day in this country? Well, this is a, a unique circumstance. Uh, I do not know of a bridge that has been constructed to withstand a direct impact from a vessel of this size. What I will say is anytime anything happens to any bridge, uh, we as a country take that and learn from that. Uh, learning from incidents as diverse as what happened to uh, I-95 in Philadelphia, what happened to I-10 in Los Angeles, uh, or uh, another case that we're learning a lot from here, which is the two 2007 collapse uh, of I-35 West in uh, Minnesota. Let me, let me emphasize that was a very different circumstance with very different causes. And the NTSB, by design, is independently leading the investigation into what those causes are. No question that we will take all of that information and apply it in our future work. Mr. Secretary, Secretary how, how long are you preparing for the shipping channel to be closed? And you mentioned supply chain. What else are you doing to make sure other ports are prepared to maybe take on some of that? Well, the, uh, uh, the, the port here in Baltimore uh, does the most vehicle handling of any port at all. And that's just talking about the vehicle side. You also have container traffic. You have bulk traffic. There is no question that this will be a major 
and protracted impact to supply chains. It's too soon to offer estimates on what it will take to clear the channel and reopen the port. Uh, there is one part uh, of the facilities here, Trade Point, which is located at Sparrow Point, which is outside of, uh, of the part that's blocked. But the main part of the Port of Baltimore is, of course, inside the channel that has been blocked. This, this is part of why we're question. fortunate to have that newly stood up freight office, which along with the Maritime Administration and all of our interagency and intergovernmental partners here, is we're going to make sure we coordinate. There, there is no central authority uh, that directs maritime traffic the way you have with air traffic. Uh, so it's going to be important to have a number of dialogues established with o ocean shippers, beneficial cargo owners, port operators, and everybody else who plays a role here. And I'm sorry, Governor, just for, just for clarity, a question from this morning. It was unclear if there were any vehicles on the bridge when the vessel hit it. Can you, do you have an update now whether there were actually vehicles on the uh, there, So uh, there's still an investigation going on uh, about which vehicles uh, that we had that was on the bridge. The thing that we that we know that we also can verify though is the quick work of our, of, of of public officials and law enforcement who kept more vehicles from coming onto the bridge. They undoubtedly saved uh, a neural amount of lives last and night. You're still looking for six people and that's it as far as you know. That's, that's, that, our, our investigation has not changed on that. Thank you. Can you tell us about the companies involved? The companies involved here, the shippers, the owners, the insurance we'll companies. We'll come back to that. Thank you. We'll come back to that. Thank you all. You have been listening there to that update from Maryland Governor Wes Moore and Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg, among others. And the headline, of course, that six people remain unaccounted for. The governor emphasizing that this is a very active search and rescue mission. They are looking for those people. They are hoping to find them something like 12, 13 hours after what you're seeing here on screen, the partial collapse of that bridge, of course, I-695, a major thoroughfare, not just for Baltimore, for Maryland, but for the region as well. I want to get to Tom Costello, who's live at that foot of that bridge in Baltimore. Tom, uh, some information here coming out, really the emphasis on the lives, the urgency of this search that is happening, and some questions about what's ahead, what's next longer term with this critical uh, shipping yeah. lane. Yeah, I, I think the, the headline out of this particular news conference is really just reiterating that, in fact, this, in their view, remains a search and rescue operation, although as the hours pass, uh, the chances of somebody surviving in that water, really, they, they drop by the minute uh, and by the hour, of course. Uh, a couple of new developments in the last few hours. The NTSB chief announcing that they've got a team of 24 investigators on the scene. They will look at a whole host, a long list of items including the maintenance and the safety record of this particular ship the Singapore sorry this this the Singapore flagged vessel that was on its way as you know uh, to Sri Lanka but NBC News confirming that in fact it had gone through 27 inspections since 2015 two deficiencies including one in which the ship hit uh, a port uh, in Antwerp Belgium and suffered hull damage as a result they'll look at the safety and maintenance history history of the of the vessel and also why it appears that the vessel lost power and then lost the ability to navigate just after leaving its berth here in the port of Baltimore at about 1 30 uh, in the morning and according to uh, all procedures and policies when you are navigating through a port uh, you need to bring on a local pilot a pilot who will help you navigate through that port so the question then becomes let's just make sure and I'm sure investigators will drill down on this was the there a local pilot on board? Did he or she oversee uh, the course of this of this vessel? And then we've talked to some structural engineers in the last couple of hours who've made it very clear. Just the law of physics, when you're talking about a vessel this big that is moving at eight knots, 9.2 miles per hour, once it got going and once it was headed for that pylon, that support uh, beam, if you will, the support structure, there's, there was nothing stopping it, and there was no way that that support structure could have ever survived. Just the law of physics would suggest that. And he, this Johns Hopkins civil engineering expert, telling us, let's be real about how long it will take to rebuild this kind of a structure stretching a mile and a half and so high above the, the port. It will take, he said, we're talking five to ten years. Uh, it, it will be a massive infrastructure project that will cost an awful lot of money. And yes, the federal government is promising to immediately come in with money to help start the process. But first, they've got to clear all the wreckage from the collapsed bridge out of the water, Hallie.
Tom Costello, thank you. I want to bring in Kevin Heaslip, the director of the Center for Transportation Research at the University of Tennessee. Uh, and Kevin, you heard Tom talking there about this ship going something like eight knots and the secretary discussing the unique circumstances here, the incredibly unique circumstances that led to the catastrophic collapse now of this bridge. Talk us through next step. What is the biggest priority for investigators moving forward? Uh, the biggest step is to understand what happened with the ship, uh, to make sure that sort of thing doesn't happen again. But the next step after that is to remove the debris from the uh, from the river. Uh, being able to open the port of Baltimore back up for cargo, uh, moving in and out of the port is the most important thing. And once that can happen, then, uh, as the governor said, the uh, economic activity, the jobs that are affected by this will, will be brought back to some sort of normalcy. Kevin, thank you so much. Again, that update there from the Maryland governor making very clear that this is still an active search and rescue operation. We expect more updates throughout the evening, of course, with this operation now, not just the mission, but the rebuilding of this bridge expected to take weeks, months, perhaps longer. We're going to have a lot more ahead on our streaming network, NBC News Now, as this concludes our NBC News special report. You can find more online at NBCNews.com. And then, of course, Lester Holt anchoring nightly news live from Baltimore on your local NBC station. I'm Hallie Jackson. Thanks for watching. If it's Tuesday, we're following breaking news out of Baltimore, where emergency rescue teams are racing to find at least six people still unaccounted for after a cargo ship crashed into the Francis Scott Key Bridge, sending the entire...